Okay, this morning we're um, looking at keeping the integrity of God's word. And um, in the Old Testament, um, integrity um, meant righteousness, soundness, goodness, everything that was whole, everything that was perfect, um, everything um, that was complete. And um, Jesus is a perfect example of integrity. And um, when he came up out of the waters of baptism, he went out into the wilderness and he was tempted by the devil and tempted and tempted, but his integrity stayed sound and it could not be moved. And he is a perfect example of righteousness, holiness, pure, um, full of good works. And the Bible says in... um, Hebrews 4.15, that he was tempted in every way that we were, but yet he was without sin. And so he was a man of integrity. And so the integrity of God's word is going to come up um, on the screen, just a, just a slide. And no, the PowerPoint, yep. So the integrity of God's word. God, integrity is holiness, righteous, purity, soundness, everything. Psalm 182, 2 says, For you have magnified your word above your name. And John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. He was in the beginning with God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so he is magnified. His word above his name. He is the word. He is God. He is integrity. Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my word that goes out forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void or empty, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing that I send it to do. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will not pass away, but my words will not pass away. John 17, 17, sanctify them in thy truth, for thy word is truth. And Matthew 4, 4, Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So God is integrity. His word is integrity. His word is true. The problem is, do we keep his word with integrity. And how do we keep integrity in, in, in the, the word, the word of integrity in these last days? Well, one of the re- things is in um, Hebrews 10, 24, 25, 26, do not neglect to assemble yourselves together as some are doing, but encourage and build one another up as you see the day approaching, as the end time is coming. <clears throat> so if we're all together here in one accord and we have integrity of the word and we can encourage one another and build up one another in the word. For 2 Timothy 4, 3 says that in these last days there's going to be false teachers. And uh, it says that people are going to gather around them. They're going to flock around them because they want the easy stuff. They just want what they want to hear. And, of course, the false teachers, they're the people they want around them. They want the people around them uh, that they can control. And so, But 2 Timothy 2.15, this is our safety net. It says, show yourself to be an approved worker rightly dividing the word of God, not listening to babbling, the babblings or ungodliness, but learn how to rightly divide the word, learn how to handle the word of God. And that's the only way we can have integrity in the word of God as we learn how to rightly divide it and keep it in its pure um, form. I would say that this is the word of God. This is the word of God. It is an inherent word. It is the word. Others will say it contains the word. And so if it just contains the word and good principles, then they can be changed from generation to generation. We're seeing lots of things change because people are not actually convinced that this is the word of God. And so this is the word of God. It doesn't contain the word of God. When the preacher preaches, does he preach the word of God or does he just preach something that contains something um, about the word of God? 
You see, if you start somewhere, where do you finish? Somebody once said, damn, on TV, look where it's progressed today. If preachers start preaching a soft gospel and a lot of their own ideas, seeker-sensitive, motivational speaking, um, changing some of the things God says, where will it end up in a few years' time? I'd like to tell you a story that when I first started preaching 35, 38 years ago, <coughs> um, before I went to Bible college, I would go walking around. I'd be walking around everywhere, praying, praying. What am I going to preach on today, Lord? What am I going to preach on today? And you'd see a need or something and, oh boy, I'd get excited and I'd start thinking about it and come up with all these stories and illustrations. And I'd go, oh, this is good, Lord. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. People need to hear this. <coughs> And, uh, yep, I got it down. And when I get home, I think, oh, better try and find a Bible verse that fits this. It's dangerous, isn't it? <clears throat> and sometimes the word that you actually mentioned you couldn't find in a concordance, but you'd find another word that you thought, well, that, that had the same sort of meaning, so that'll do, that'll fit. <laughs> And so you get up and you read out your text and off you launch and it's got nothing to do with anything in the text. It was just all your inspiration and the good idea that you got that you thought um, might have been from God. That was about 35 years ago. But what's happened today with our modern preaching and seeker-sensitive and motivational speaking, um, <clears throat> where could it have ended up today? Well, I'll let you decide. <clears throat> so I'll just make a statement. Change your words, change your life. Open your Bibles to Isaiah 57, verses 18 and 19, <clears throat> in the New King James Version. And it says there, I have seen his ways and will heal him, and I will also lead him and restore comforts to him and his mourners. I create the fruit of your lips... Peace, peace to him who is afar off and to him who is near. And now I progress to say that God said, I create and I form and I'm fashion and I'm like a potter. And I listen to what you say and I create and I, I mould and I shape and I bring about um, what, what you speak. How do I get God to work in my life? How do I get his miracle working power in my life? It seems like it's created to the words that we speak. And God says, if you will speak, if you will praise, if you will confess, <clears throat> I will bring that to being, the fruit of your lips. That is utterance. And if you keep confessing and confessing, then I will bring it to pass. And um, the text in Hebrews 10 23 says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And so man has the power to speak, and just, and just as God can speak, we can speak. So whatever you want, you can't just have whatever you want, but if you find something in the scripture and you think it's true, then you just start confessing it and confessing it, and because it's true, it will come, come to pass. Romans 3, 4 says, Let God be true and every man a liar. Change your words, change your life. If you want to become something different, change what you are confessing. That's life-changing. Isaiah 57 says, I create the fruit of your lips. <clears throat> Hebrews 11, 13, 15 says, Therefore by him let us continually offer sacrifices of praises to God. That is the fruit of your lips, giving thanks to his name. Let us continually, not just a one-off thing. You don't just have something because you speak it once. Um, you have to speak it continually and you have to confess it. And he's going um, to bring it to pass. God fashions and forms and creates in the future the words that I pray, praise and speak. He creates and forms that. Yes, I praise him. My steps are ordered by the Lord. He supplies um, all my needs. I thank you, Lord, I'm favoured. I thank you, Lord, I'm blessed. I repeat, God says I create and fashion uh, what you speak. 
Mark 11, 23 and 24 says, And Jesus answered them and said, Have faith in God. If you have faith as a mustard seed, and you say to this mountain, Be moved and cast into the sea, it shall <coughs> be done for you. Oh. Let the weak say, I am strong. I am not falling or failing. I am not going back. I am strong. When you start saying that, God forms a new you in you in the future. And that's how he keeps building you. Now that sermon was from a modern mega church pastor in America, one of the biggest um, mega churches. And I have quoted exactly what he said. And he kept going and he kept going and round and round in circles for a while. Circles, I think, trying to find um, a place to land. My guess is after the church service, people would have come up and said, oh, that's good, Pastor. Oh, that's absolutely awesome. Um, yeah, we've got to hold fast to the confession of our faith. That's what we have to do. Yes, uh, it said the uh, praise has got to be continually on our lips. Yes, that needs to be. Yes, Pastor, I get that. Oh, Pastor, yeah, we've we got to speak the mountains, you know, and we've got to move things for God. And if we believe, yes, all these mighty things are going to happen. However, this sermon had absolutely nothing to do with the text, nothing to do with scripture. It wasn't thus saith the Lord, it was thus said the preacher. It wasn't even the same paddock of the text in Isaiah 57. And so this is what our modern preaching is becoming and people are preaching all this stuff and everyone's getting excited and hanging on to it had nothing to do whatsoever with the text in any shape or form whatsoever. <clears throat> and we've all been guilty of that. And it's really difficult because I can believe in healing and someone else can have the same Bible and they, they reckon it doesn't, doesn't exist. Um, you come to end times or something where it might talk about it being mysteries and it might say that people in the end times will understand and, and to Depending on how much you study it, you might come up with something different uh, <coughs> from someone else. And sometimes you get a text um, that might be talking about something like binding and loosing, um, whatever you forbid and whatever you permit. It might be in the context in Matthew of, of forgiveness. <coughs> and it's whatever you bind and loose. But in another place, there's no example, but it just says whatever. And so sometimes something can be used in... Um, Different, you know, it can be used in one and the same thing can be, apply somewhere else, even though primarily it was meant for a certain situation there. <clears throat> this guy would have been better off if he had have wanted to talk about speaking to a mountain, had gone to that passage and looked at it and looked at other scriptures and saw what it was saying then and how it could apply today. And um, we've all done this, but we've got to get better. Because we've got to keep the integrity of God's word. And in the last days, there's going to be false teachers and false preachers. And um, God's word is pure. It is the word of God. It doesn't just contain it. And when we preach it, it's got to be what the word says, not dreaming up all our ideas. <clears throat> so now, what does the text really say? So now when you go to Isaiah 57, <clears throat> it'll come up on the screen. But just... But just in the pretext of it before it starts, you understand there that the people, God's people are backslidden. That happens all the time. He brings them back to God, they backslide. It's the same today. Nothing changes. False teachers and false leaders, then there's going to be false preachers today. Nothing changes. So what's here can be applicable to us. <coughs> but he says there in verse 10 of um, just in um, 56... He's talking about the sinful leaders. <clears throat> and he said, For the leaders of my people, 
the Lord's watchmen, uh, you haven't got that on the screen, I'm just, just reading it. Lord, his shepherds are blind and ignorant. They are like silent watchdogs that give no warning when danger comes. They love to lie around sleeping and dreaming. Like greedy dogs, they are never satisfied. They are ignorant shepherds following their own path for personal gain. Now, the King James Version calls them dumb dogs that can't bark. And so God is calling his preachers and his elders and his leaders dumb dogs. They can't bark. They don't warn the people. All they do is lay around all day dreaming and dreaming up the things that they want and um, they're after greedy gain. And we see that today. There's a lot of preachers <coughs> that are silent or you could call them dumb dogs. It's seeker sensitive. It's motivational. Um, they I like that first sermon I preached. <coughs> the guy must have been laying around dreaming all day that, you know, maybe he wanted more money in his church or something like that, but had nothing to do with the Word of God. And that still applies today because it says in the last days there's going to be false preachers. People are going to gather around preachers that will tell them what they want to hear. That's what was happening here but the Lord calls them dumb dogs that don't bark. They don't speak up. They don't warn the people. They don't preach the truth. They sit around all, all day daydreaming. And that's what a lot of pastors and preachers do today. They get so busy all week, and on the way to church on Sunday morning, they're daydreaming all the stuff they're going to speak, and while the service is on, they've got the phone out trying to find a text that'll match it. But we've got to get away from doing that. We've got to get back to the integrity um, of God's word. <clears throat> and then in 57, like at um, verse 1, um, he's talking about the righteous. And it says, Good people pass away, the godly often die before their time, but no one seems to care or wonder, no one seems to understand that God is protecting them from the evil to come. For those who follow godly paths will rest in peace when they die. And it's like today, nobody cares about the righteous. A lot of churches, you know, if you want to stick to the old-fashioned gospel and, um, and all that sort of thing and stand to God's principles, um, people don't, don't care about, you know, you're just an old prude, you won't move with the times. And um, there's a lot of this still today. A lot of the church system doesn't care about the righteous. They care about dreaming up their own ideas. The Bible calls them dumb dogs that don't bark or don't warn. <coughs> and now it begins, um, like in 57.4, it just sort of, it's now just talking about God's people who have backslidden. And it says there, your offspring of adulterers and prostitutes whom do you mock, making faces and sticking your tongues out, you liars and sinners. And, and uh, it's like a lot of people today are sticking their tongues out at God. You know, God has a standard on marriage. God has a standard for our life. God has a standard on this. But people are poking their tongues out at God because they want something different. But the preachers and the elders and the leaders need not to be silent. We don't sit around dreaming uh, preaching that God's going to create and fashion and give you everything you want just because that verse in that text said, I create on your lips, which had nothing to do um, with the text. Then it says down there a bit, you have worshipped idols and have been unfaithful to me. And so now we get to our text, uh, what the, the guy read out, but just a few verses before that, it's going to come up on the screen, 50, um, Isaiah 57 will come up at verse 15. The high and the lofty one who lives in eternity, the holy one says, I live in the holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit and the humble and receive the, the, the courage of those who have repentant hearts. And what he's saying is that he is the holy one. He is lofty. He is righteous. He, he is the eternity. He lives in heaven. And um, the ones that worship him, the ones that have been crushed, the ones that have been um, depressed, um, those ones that um, are just lost, who, 
who want to be humble and bring themselves low. He wants to dwell with you. And um, that's what he wants. He wants to bring um, back those. I want to restore the crushed spirit. And then in um, verse 16, it says, I will not fight against you forever. I will not always be angry. If I were, all people would pass away and all the souls I have made. I was angry, so I punished those greedy people, but I withdrew from them, but they kept on um, their stubborn way. And praise God, he didn't give up on the people because he said he was angry with them, he was sick of them, um, he could have just let them all go to hell. They could have all just perished. But praise God, he has grace, amen? Amen. He's a God of grace. That's what it says in Peter, Second Peter. That's what it says, you know, where is the promise of his coming back? He's not slow as some would think. He's wishing that none should perish. And so he is a God of grace. Even though these people here were so backslidden and turned away and they were dumb dogs and they were poking their face in God and sinning, um, he said, well, I can't just let them perish. I can't. He's a God of grace. So he has to do something. And so, um, uh, so, stubborn way. so verse 18. I have seen what they do, but I will heal them anyway. I will lead them. I will comfort those who mourn. And how we have what the other guy said, the new, bringing pray, words of praise to their lips. And the King James Version had, he will create praise um, on their lips. Many, may they have abundant peace, both near and far, says the Lord who heals them. But those who still reject me are like the restless sea, which is never still, but continually churns up mud and dirt. There is no peace for the wicked, says my God. <clears throat> and so basically what he's saying there, if you're backslidden, if you don't know God, you're... <laughs> There's no rest for the wicked. There's no peace. It's like you are drowning in the sea. The waves are crushing against the rocks and you've been dragged along the sand and you can't see and um, you just know you're going to drown and you know you're going to die and that's what it's like for the wicked and those who are backslidden. There's just no peace and there's just no rest. <clears throat> but it says he's going to create the fruit of their lips. Here it says he's going to put praise on their lips and the, and the King James said he was going to create praise. How is he going to create it? Nothing to do with confession and getting everything you want. What happens is that you've been backslidden. You've walked away from God. And now you've come to him. There's no rest. There's no peace. Now all of a sudden you've come back to God and you've got peace and joy. You can't help but praise hallelujah. You just can't help it. You're just going to burst out. I thank you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. Lord, you're just such a good God. I had no peace and no joy. I was a drowning man. I was a drowning woman. Oh, God, I've got nothing but praise for you. Oh, Lord, you could have given up on us. We could have all just perished, but you had grace and you had patience with us and you persevered with us and you didn't give up on us. Oh, God, you're just such a good God. I just praise you. My lips are full of praise because you're an awesome God. And it says there that you, would, you were going to restore, you were going to heal, and you were going to lead us back. Oh, praise you, God. You're just a great leader. You're a great restorer. You've healed, you've saved, you've put peace back in my life. Praise God, hallelujah. That's what that text was about. Absolutely nothing to do with a modern megachurch pastor and his fairy tale ideas and his dreamings. Nothing whatsoever. And that's the sort of preaching we're getting. I've been caught, I've done it before, lots do it, but it's not the integrity of the word and we've got to stop doing it. So you see, that text in Isaiah, <clears throat> it could be somebody in this church today that's backslidden. It could be someone online that's backslidden. There could be a thousand other preachers all over the world um, that have preached that. And they need to come back to God. 
There's no peace. There's no joy. Um, they're drowning. And so what does Isaiah 55, 11 said? It says, So my word that goes forth from my mouth shall not return to me void, but shall accomplish what I please. It shall prosper and do the thing I want, I've sent it to do. And so <clears throat> what I just preached to you this morning, if a person in Brazil is backslidden or doesn't know Christ or someone online or someone here, because I've preached that somewhere, somewhere around the world, someone is going to respond to that. His word isn't going to return void or empty. He's going to accomplish it. Hallelujah. But not if I preach the other sermon. Couldn't. His word can't accomplish because I butchered it. I didn't keep the integrity of the word. I was one of those preachers that is too interested in motivational preaching and getting money out of people and seeker sensitive <coughs> and um, not warning and not telling people and laying around all day dreaming. And guess what? The Bible told us it was coming. It said in the last days there's going to be false teachers and preachers. And people are going to seek out those ones because they don't want to hear thus saith the Lord. They want to hear thus say what I want to do. They want to poke their fingers and thumbs at God. But then the false teacher and preacher... He doesn't want me around him. He wants all those ones around. They want their ears tickled. And so that's what's happening and that's where we are. And the only thing that's going to keep you and I safe is the integrity of the word of God. We've got to learn how to handle it properly and how to handle it correctly and how to divide it properly. That's what we need to do. Just before I... Praise Sharon, I just want to just um, play. You see, I've sort of got hold of this saying I heard someone say, and it says, um, start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible. So if I start in the Bible here in Isaiah 57, what I have is a whole lot of uh, backslidden people. If I stay in the Bible there, then I find that God is going to restore them and bring them back. And if I finish there in the Bible, I find that he's going to put praise on their lips and glory on their lips and they're going to be happy they're back in fellowship with God. But if I start and he's going to create the praise on my lips in the Bible and then I leave the Bible and I come up with all my ideas that I can have what I want and just like God spoke in the garden, I can speak and I can do all that. Well, then where do I finish? I just finish making myself some superhero and feeling great and I can change the world. And maybe you can and maybe there's, uh, there's texts that we can preach on that can um, lead us in some areas. But that guy butchered the text. Why? He didn't start in, he started in the Bible, but he didn't stay in there and he didn't finish there. Hallelujah. Praise God. So this morning, if you're backslidden and you're far away from God, just where you are in your seat. You can say, God, I'm a drowning person. I have no peace. I'm just all over the place. I'm smashed up against the rocks. And I've poked my fingers in your face, God, and I've said, not now, I'm not interested. And the same with people listening online. But you can say, oh, God, I might not have been alive today. I could have been killed yesterday. You could have let me perish. But God, you're a God of mercy and you're a God of grace. And if that's you and if someone online, just where you are, you can just get right with God. Repent that you are a sinner. Tell him that he is Lord, he is good. Ask for forgiveness of your sins. Determined by the power of the Spirit to walk and live differently. Because it's not just a matter of... I could ask us to come up the front, but... Lots of people come up the front, but the next day they don't mean it. 
you know, but the thing is, the Bible says in Matthew 3, 8, bear fruit in accordance with repentance. 720, by the fruit you shall know them. 1128, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And if there's other preachers preach that message over the world, over the, in somewhere in the world today, then that word can touch them too and bless them. And so if you're in that wayward position, you need to get right with God today. And if you do, you can come and talk to me after. Or you can talk to Pastor Lisa. Um, but we have to get back to God's word. The integrity of God's word. That's the only thing that will keep us. This, contain, this doesn't contain the word. This is the word. I hope my preaching this morning was the word and wasn't just contain some of my bright ideas. And in the past, I know that I've done the same as those others. But past is past. Future is we've got to read the Word of God in context, start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible. And all these preachers that want to be millionaires and trillionaires and getting all their partners and getting all the money coming into them, you know, there's no Bible verse for that. There's none anywhere. All the Bible says is put aside a sum each week um, as you may prosper uh, to give for the collection, you know, for the missionaries, or it says sow sparingly, reap sparingly, and you decide in your heart what to give, and that God will make all grace abound to you and supply all your needs, and it says there'll be some left over to bless others, to disperse to the poor. All this rubbish that God just told me, the first 10 people that come out and put $1,000 in this plate, we've got to leave all that rubbish behind. We've got to, it's not in the Word, don't preach it. And I think that's sort of where I am at the moment. I'm going to get back to the integrity of God's Word, and we all need to do that. So, Father, we just thank you and praise you for your Word. You're a great God. And, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that anybody at the sound of my voice, anyone in the room, anyone online, uh, good morning to everyone. One online, apologise for not saying that before. Uh, God bless you. God touch you. Um, if you're drowning with no peace and no joy, then God is waiting for you to come back. He said he lives with those who have a crushed spirit and are humble and have, and have been healed and been restored. And he'll give you peace and he'll give you joy and he'll put praise on your lips if you will respond to him today. And the challenge for the rest of us is to, to keep the integrity of the Word of God and not our own dreamings. So, Father, I pray that this Word will bless and touch people in Jesus' name. Amen. So God bless you all. Have some fellowship. and. <laughs>